Glenn Chandler is an award-winning playwright, author and director. His best-known work being the TV show Taggart, running from 1985 to 2010. Since then, he has focused more on theatre. His company, Boys of the Empire, bring a show annually to the Fringe and often transfer back to London at Above the Stag Theatre. Hello, Glenn. How are you doing today? I'm doing just fine, thank you. Just waiting for the spring. Oh, aren't we all, aren't we all? The spring of the past couple of years. <laughs> well, we're so thankful for you coming on this afternoon to chat to us about um, about your work. And on, on this episode of The Essentials, we're, we're going to, of course, cover your career, but we want to really um, deep dive into The Fringe and, and your experiences on the Edinburgh Fringe, uh, of which you have, have many. Um, but we'd like to just start off by talking about yourself. So if you could, I mean, you, you've worked uh, on so many things over the years, but if you could give us a little summary of your professional journey in the industry and a bit about your theatre company boys of the empire okay i i well i started um long before taggart and long before television i started in theatre with uh, a number of lunchtime mm. lunchtime plays who does lunchtime plays anymore just begin to think about them, starting to think about that um but they did the series of lunchtime plays at the <laughs> soho poly theatre uh, which was near oxford circus and um i spent a few years writing for writing for theatre after not getting anywhere sending scripts to the BBC. And I think I got about 37 rejections from the BBC. So I thought, hell, I'm going to go into theatre. Um, so I did that. And then eventually television came along and uh, I got the opportunity to write Taggart. And I spent the next 25 something years writing for television. And uh, at the end of all that, I kind of thought to myself, well, television is it's very different now. You know, I've had a bloody good series. Um, I don't think I'm going to get another one of the length of Taggart. So why don't I go back and do theatre again? So I did a full circle, went back, um, mm. did a show at the Edinburgh Fringe in 2008 called Boys of the Empire. And somebody said to me, well, that's a great name for a theatre company, isn't it? So I thought, why not Boys of the Empire Productions? And I've been going back to Edinburgh ever since. Fantastic. Amazing. Well, yeah, what, what is well, it about the fringe about? that makes you keep going back? Well, we're trying to ask the same question. This we'll double down on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, what, what, what is it? Is it? Is it about that makes you keep going back? <laughs> it it's an addiction, I think. <laughs> uh, the first time I did it, um, I'd never you'd I'd never have believed that I was going to actually produce a show on the Edinburgh Fringe. I thought it was something just beyond what I could possibly do, and I actually produced two shows that year. One was somebody else's, and one was mine. And um, the director that I worked with called Patrick Wilde, he, he said to me, look, Len, he said, when you go up there, he said, you will never, never, ever not want to go back. <laughs> It'll become like a drug. You will meet so hmm. many people. Hmm. You will meet so many people. They will, you will know them in 10, 20 years time. They will introduce you to other people and they will introduce you to other people. And you, you'll just make so many contacts that uh, you, you'll just want to go back the following year to do it again. And he's perfectly true. It was perfectly true. I met, I met and experienced so many people on that 2008 expedition to Edinburgh that um, changed my life in a way. Uh, it, it was just mm. um, television's, television's fantastic, but you don't see your audience. Your audience are out there somewhere. But you never see them with, with the fringe. You're sitting there every day watching the show that you've written or directed or produced. And you're seeing your audience and you're talking to them afterwards and you're meeting people. It's a totally different environment. It's wonderful. Yes. Yeah. It's much more intimate, isn't it? Yeah. Do you think fringe theatre is unfairly looked down upon or underappreciated under by creatives who haven't perhaps done it? I don't think so. I, I, I've never met anybody in my career who said to me, oh, the fringe is beneath me. I wouldn't I wouldn't go there. Um, I've met people who say, oh, I won't I won't do the fringe because there's so many other productions up there. It's hard to get noticed. And this is true. It is very, very hard to get noticed. When you look at the, number, the thousands of shows which are going on, I mean, you know, in three weeks there, I, I, I can barely take in more than about 0.1% of the shows which are on and which I would like to see. Mm. So people people have said that to me. Uh, I, you know, I, I just don't want to get there and get drowned. But it's the process of going up there and getting drowned in a way which is, which is really exciting. 
So I, I would say I don't know anybody Fantastic. who looks down on it. And there are a lot of and a lot of big professional actors go up and do the fringe. I've I've never heard of getting drowned as being a positive experience before in my life. So this was a, <laughs> oh, well. this was a new one. I, I love it. And you you mentioned I, there the, the, the fear that the some create. Well. <laughs> Not yet. I'm yet to be drowned. I need to go get get involved there. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but well, um, you mentioned there it. how some that would be yeah. I was I mean I was I was going to say what you said there about people are worried about their shows being. Um, being missed out on or, or not being noticed apart from once you've developed a reputation of course where you get shows put on there not automatically but you, you get sought out to put them on how do you get your shows to stand out how do you get audiences to come watch your production well first of all you've got to get you've got to get that um that magic that magic ingredient called publicity uh you can you can hire a mm. you can hire a, a, one of these publicity gurus who will look, be going up to the fringe who will probably be doing about 20 shows and yours will be one of the 20 he's doing or she is doing and you don't know whether yours is getting all the attention that it should do or the other 19 are getting more attention than yours so it's it's a it's a balance you've got to strike i've i've used um i've used a, a publicity guru uh, on a couple of occasions one was good one was not very good and then I thought, well, you know, we've got social media down nowadays. Let's, you know, do, let's do it ourselves. And if you're really, really good at social media, you can uh, you can do most of the publicity thing yourself. But the other thing, of course, is to have a show that stands out. There's no good. There's no good going up there with a uh, another production of what Midsummer's Night's Dream, where everybody's dressed in, where everybody's in the nude or something like that. You know, all right, that may be that may be exciting, <laughs> but uh, you know, um, you, know, you look at this program, you say, oh God, there's another yeah, Midsummer fun. Night's Dream, and, and they're wearing yellow costumes, and they're, God, they're dressed as knights of armor, and so you know, um, you've got to have something that stands out and something that's new and that's different, and 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 the one thing which I think is is very very important. And this might this might sound you know a bit tacky. You've got to have a good poster. If you when you go out to Edinburgh, there are posters mm. absolutely everywhere. Uh, you can't you can't walk down any street without seeing posters, posters, posters. They're coming at you all all every every which way, but you know every which way you can. But I, I, a lot of them begin to look the same, and a lot of them pall on you. So I I have a I'm very lucky. I have a very good um, artistic chappy graphics designer who who designed some fantastic posters for me. And we, lo we look at them and we think, what's really going to grab people? What's the poster that you see in the street that you cannot tear your eyes away from, that you keep seeing? I'll give you an example. I did a show called Kids Play uh, two years ago. And I had a very good looking young actor that I, I met up on the Friends a year before who, who appeared in the poster wearing a pair of underpants, um, a set of handcuffs hanging off his wrist and clutching a teddy bear. And it was the most eye-catching image you could imagine. We had yeah. we had people coming coming to the theatre. I want a ticket for that show. You know, it's it's the poster with the guy with the handcuffs and the teddy bear. They couldn't remember the title, but they could remember what the poster looked like. You, if you if you if you have a bloody good image, uh, you're honestly you're a good 30, 40 percent of the way there, and a good title as well helps. Amazing. You mentioned a lot of really good tips there, but what what are the major do's and don'ts for actors? going to the Edinburgh Fringe to work? Right. I would say when I asked a very good uh, producer uh, who'd done the Fringe many years if, if I should do it, uh, she said to me, um, she said to me, yes, do it. But the most important thing to do is, is to enjoy yourself there. Now, that, that, sound, that maybe makes it sound cheap, but it isn't. You don't go to the Fringe to make money. Uh, you might go to the fringe to get yourself seen and to get yourself noticed, um, and you will, but maybe you won't be thrust onto a West End stage because of it. The chances are you won't. So why do we go to the fringe? We go to the fringe. I go to the fringe because I really enjoy the experience. If you come away from the fringe saying, my God, I enjoyed every second of that. People I met, the show that I put on, the show that I did, it was the best experience of my life. You 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 found a good reason to go there. Don't go there for money. Uh, don't go there for fame. 
Um, don't go there because you think it's going to change your life overnight because it won't. You've got to go over there for the experience. It's a bit like the journey. The journey is the journey is better than the destination. The journey is more important than the destination. Get up there at the start of August. Do that journey right through to the end of August. And uh, regardless of where it deposits you at the end, you might you might be penniless and totally exhausted and an alcoholic and you put on 10 tons of weight with all the burgers that you've eaten. Uh, but you still had a damn good time. Painting a great picture there. <laughs> <laughs> you wait, you wait till you get there. Well, I'm, I'm going for, for the burgers and the teddy bears. That's the way to go. Um, you mentioned about, we, we spoke about getting shows that um, stand out and, um, you know, that's getting the, the initial bums on the seats there. But, you know, critical reception can be so important at the fringe. Why, you know, if you get uh, critics come in and review you really well, it can make a run and vice versa, maybe, you know, ruin a run. Um, what makes an award-winning show or a critically approved show at the Fringe? Not that that's you know what you're seeking out, but it can certainly <laughs> be important. Is that is that back to sort of the publicity in the poster, or is that down to the 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 actors, the script, or a combination of all of that? It's a, it's a combination of everything. I mean, you can have you can have the best publicity in the world. You you can have um, uh, you can get your you can get your reviewers in. You can have a fantastic poster. You can have a fantastic everything. But if the play isn't any good, and your actors aren't any good, then you're then you're sunk. Um, it's it's a little bit it's a little bit of everything. I I um, I mean I I learned the hard way. We did a my first show, Boys of the Empire, uh, which I didn't actually direct, um, but uh, I was you know involved in the production and I produced it and I was involved in it all the way through, and it was a case of. Um, it was a case of, of casting actors that we knew. Uh, casting actor, there were one or two we had to audition, but we we just you got to get an instinct for people who actors who are going to be good on the fringe. I always cast you now people that I want to live with for three weeks, four weeks of my life. Uh, there's no good an actor coming into an audition room and you think, oh, he's a bloody good actor, fantastic. I think he's really suited the part. My God, can I live in a flat with this guy for four weeks? And that's the other thing. You know, if you're not getting on with your actors, um, the, the, the show is going to suffer. So I would, I would rather say to a really fantastic actor, sorry, I'm not going to take you, and take one that's maybe not quite so good, but it's somebody that I know I'm going to get on with. And I've had few, I've had one or two bad experiences. You don't always get it right. But uh, that, that to me is the most important, the most important criterion. Amazing. And how are you able to transfer a lot of your plays from the Fringe back to London? Because I know that's such a difficult thing to do. Well, I have a very good um, relationship with the Above the Stag Theatre down in down in Vauxhall. And from the very start, but in the right. Bull who ran the theatre, uh, as soon as he's... I mean, I was, <clears throat> I was very anxious to transfer uh, something down there. And uh, as soon as we got about six reviews, six really good, sort of good five-star reviews, I was rung up saying... Uh, yes, do you want to bring it down here? <laughs> so, um, so my relationship with the Above the Stag Theatre is such that it hasn't been a problem, and uh, I've now I've now transferred four productions from the uh, from the Edinburgh Fringe. The very first one, Boys of the Empire, that went that went to the King's Head, and uh, that had nothing to do with mm. me. That was they, that was just picked up by the King's Head, who I think who I think were there at the time, and we we had a lovely run at the at the. At the, at the King's Head Theatre, so but above the stag has been has been a fantastic theatre for me. Haven't always been able to do it with the same cast. Uh, usually, I've had to recast. I certainly did with the last one, but just one part. But um, that's never a problem. There, there is no shortage of good actors out there. Is that just due to actors scheduling and things like that? Uh, yes, yes, very much so. I mean, I. I I uh, I just did I did a show called The Good Scout last year in Edinburgh, which was based on the the true story about how members of the Hitler Youth came over to England and went on camping and cycling holidays with British Boy Scouts. Not a lot of people knew about that, and uh, it was um, it was a hook to get people in. People thought Hitler Youth Boy Scouts, you know what's not to like about this? And um, I cast uh, a young man called uh, Clement Charles who I spotted a couple of years ago in Edinburgh, and he came up to me and said, I want to work with you. And I said, well, I'd like to work with you too. Um, and he was cast as the Good Scout. But uh, when when it came to the transfer, he had to go away and do another show um, over in over in Croatia. He was playing Romeo, Romeo and Juliet in Croatia. And you can't stop somebody doing that. 
So um, we, we, we cast another lad mm. called Daniel Cornish and he picked up the role in, uh, in down in London and, uh, and did it very well indeed. Yeah, I remember. I remember watching the show at the Above the Stag. It was it was fantastic. Um, what is the rehearsal process like for a transfer? I've only ever done one, and that was a a long period of time after the first one, so it was almost a, a fresh experience completely. So, what what are the differences between the original rehearsal schedule and the new one? And actually, as you just briefly mentioned, what is it like? recasting a role is that difficult because you've attached an actor as you said in the good scout to that role so yeah. strongly is it difficult to find someone else or um does that almost you know help you target exactly yeah. what you're looking for more i'm sort of muddling my questions there but I'm, i hope you get my meaning right I, let me t- let me let me tell you this when we when we left edinburgh i was i was going back on the train from edinburgh after the production of the good scout and before i left edinburgh i had already put an advert on spotlight for an actor to take the role of uh, the Good Scout in London, I had just under four hundred submissions, um, and it, it's terrifying when you get you know four hundred actors wanting a part. Uh, so you know I'm, I'm well aware, I'm well aware of the, the competition there and how awful it is and difficult it is. So I went through the four hundred and with two or three members of my cast helping me, we whittled it down and whittled it down and eventually auditioned about about thirty people. And uh, Daniel, in fact, Daniel, in fact, was the first one who came along. The first, the first of the two days of auditions, the first to walk into the room, and nobody else matched up to him. We thought we we gave him the part, <clears throat> and he was very different. He he played it totally different from uh, the way Clement <clears throat> did it in Edinburgh. And of course, when you've got one actor who plays a part differently, it affects the roles of all the others. So you get a very different show. It's not just the same show with another actor slotted into it different show entirely yeah do, yeah do, do you feel there's a difference in how you approach work to other directors when you're mainly directing the work yourself or as opposed to you writing it yourself you mean approach you mean directing you mean directing other works rather than those that i've written because i haven't i've I've, yes, I've, yeah, yeah, I've, yeah. I've, i have to say i've never directed anything that i haven't written uh the reason the reason i went back into theater um, initially was that I really wanted to I wanted the freedom to produce and direct my own stuff um, when you're a writer you know you give something to your agent and it, it goes all over the place and it goes to people who reject it and you know I, I'd been through all this with television and I thought what am I going to do am I going to write stage plays and just get my agent to send them out to theatre directors and theatre producers and go through all the stuff that that entails I thought, no, I've got the opportunity to direct in Edinburgh. Um, it's my com- my company. I'm the producer. I can employ which director I want, so I'm employing myself. And in fact, the very first one I directed was at the Tabard. I, t- I, took, um, I took a gamble. I got the rights to um, a book called The Custard Boys, which was about teenage evacuees during the war uh, living in the Norfolk countryside. It was a very dramatic book. And uh, I just thought, this would make a fantastic stage play. This is going to be the one that I do. So I went down to the Tabard Theatre and booked the Tabard Theatre, um, took on an excellent production manager who helped me a lot with my my, my first directing debut. And um, I came out of it thinking, I want to do this again. <laughs> it was terrifying. I, I was I was I was confronted by six on the first day of rehearsal, I was confronted by six lads just out of drama school. Um, I'd never directed anything in my life before. And uh, I thought to myself, well, okay, you've got to believe in me. I've got to believe in myself. You know, the, moment I, the moment I flounder and look as though I don't know what I'm doing, I'm going to be lost. Uh, it was a baptism by fire, but one I really, really enjoyed. That's fantastic. Oh, it's, it's a theatre that Christian and I know quite well. Is the the Tabard. It, uh, presumably we're meaning the same place um, in Chiswick, uh, um, up the road from yeah. where... Uh, where we both trained I've, I've been there once it, it's a lovely venue um are there any other fringe theaters or theater companies that you might have uh, seen their work before that you think more people should be aware of because there's so many so much discussion on twitter about huge theaters and huge actors and things that it's nice to get the opportunity to you know shout out some other people that might not necessarily get appreciated as much yeah, I would look at uh, There's a lot of, I mean, the new new theatre companies come up every year and sometimes you never hear from them again or never hear of them again. A lot of them are, a lot of them are centred around colleges. 
um, universities. Uh, a lovely, a lovely company called Paper Mug Theatre, um, which were at, who were at the Fringe last year, and they're doing some good work. And um, I believe they've got something planned for the Fringe this year, and and hoping it all goes, um, you know, hoping it all goes ahead. Uh, we should be in a better state by August. Mm. But I think I think the thing is to it's just yeah, it's just look look for new company, look for new companies, new new productions, look for the companies that are uh okay, there are other well, you know, the well tried names, the ones that have been there before. Um but uh, I think there's there's uh, there's every reason to just look out something new, a new company, a new production, new bun a new bunch of folk up there doing it for the first time and support them. That's that's what a that's what a company up there for the first time needs. Is support uh, the ones who've maybe been there ten times? Um, I've got it all. They've, well, they think they've got it all, and hope they've got it all worked out. But the the newbies going up there, they need every bit of help they can get. And that's what I would say to anybody going to the fringe. Is you know, it's a place where you help each other out. Yeah, I've never been myself. It really sounds like a, a family environment up there. I know there's a lot of people going, but yeah, it's, yeah, that's really great that you all support newbies and. Well, in the time that you've spent working professionally in the industry, what good changes have you seen? I think there's been. An, what do you want to see? Going I think forward? there's been an explosion in in the fringe. Uh, there seem to be more fringe theatres, more fringe productions. The, the Edinburgh Fringe gets bigger every year. Uh, last year, I, I've never seen so, the, the brochure gets thicker. You know, you can put you can put the brochures. I keep the brochures and I put them side by side. So this is definitely thicker than this last year's, and this one is definitely thicker than the year before. Uh, yeah, the, the, mm. there are there are more production companies, more people out there, and a lot of a lot of drama students as well. The advice I give to them, they, you know, they're coming out of drama schools, thinking, well, uh, you know, who's going to employ me? And I would say to every drama student coming out of every drama school, and you've probably heard this before, is make your own work is find a, find a show, yeah. raise the funds, however you do it, Kickstarter or get your granny to, you know, dip into her inheritance or something, but make your own work and put it on. Don't <laughs> wait, don't wait, don't wait, don't wait for somebody to come along and employ you and give you a good part on the West End. You know, it ain't going to happen overnight. You've got to go out and do it and be seen. I mean, actors, loads of actors I've seen in Edinburgh, just out of drama school. You know, they've written the show, they've produced it, they've directed it, they've put it on, and people are coming along and seeing it, and they're seeing them, and that that's the way that's the way to go ahead. It's lovely. Are there are there any? Um, you, you spoke there about things that are existing that are that have changed that are great. Are there any things that you you know when you go up to the fringe every year or whenever you're just working in theatre in general? Are there things that you personally want to see improve or change? or some things that you actually really, really want to stay the same that could be lost? I know it's quite vague. Uh, uh, uh. Um, oh, gosh. Um, I, don't th- I don't think there's anything I would want to change about the way the, about the, way the, the fringe operates. I think individual people going up there need to just find out what their own, what their own priorities are and, and, and go with that. It's, it's, mm. it's a very, very crowded environment. I mean, I would like to think that there was an easier way at the fringe for people to get themselves noticed. Uh, there isn't. You are fighting for every single drop of publicity you can. You can you can write to reviewers. You can write to publicity people. You can <clears throat> phone up the newspapers and say, "Look, you know, I've got a I've got a play on here. It's one of the most brilliant things that's ever been done." And they're going to say, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've heard it all before." Um, it would be nice. It would be nice if there were. If there were more inroads to good publicity for people, uh, that's that's the hardest part: getting people to come along and see your show if it's new and if it's undiscovered. Um, you and you've 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 just got to do the hard work. There isn't an easy way about it. You've got a flyer. I mean, I go up there every year, and uh, you know, my company flyer. We go. We're out, we're out, not necessarily in the high street, which is where everybody goes. You've got to find a novel way of slipping people flyers. I went, I I used to go around the uh, the various um, space venues in Edinburgh because the space has about eight eight or nine different venues. And I went around last year and I said, "Do you want to come and see a play about Boy Scouts and the Hitler Youth?" And most people would go, well, "Yeah, well, that sounds really exciting." So I give them a flyer and I chat to them, and um, you know, just chucking a flyer at somebody in the middle of a street and not telling them anything about the show is. Um, is uh 
you know, is, is really a waste of time. So I, I would, no, there's nothing, there's nothing I'd want to change at all. I think it's, I think the hard, it's, it's hard work, but you, there's no way you can make it easier for anybody. There are too many people up there, too many shows, too many productions. You've got to go out there and believe that you're, yours is the one and make sure people know it. Good. And going back to something you mentioned previously about the 400 submissions and actors coming to audition. Yes. What do you look for? in actors when they come to audition for you? What really makes them stand out? Uh, <laughs> well, I usually tell within five seconds of them walking into the room. And I think anybody doing an audition um, hmm. will tell you the same thing. I, I always have actors uh, in the audition room with me because they help to read the parts. Um, I don't I don't ask them to come in with some, with um you know with prepared pieces. I say, look, I want you to do a piece of the play and I chuck that at them and I get one of the actors working with me and doing the auditioning to 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 do the reading with the actor in the room. And on every occasion, the actors I ask to take part in the auditions say to me, Gosh, is that what it's like at the other end? Because well, they're they're going for auditions as well for shows, <laughs> and they and they're seeing they're seeing all people coming in and doing the most terrible things that they, that they would never do. I mean, I've had I've had actors coming in and being rude to me in the first ten seconds, you know, not intentionally, but just you know, <laughs> just, just saying the wrong thing, and you know, these little things you think, oh God, you've mm. just said the wrong thing there, mate. I'm not taking you to Edinburgh. I'm sorry, <laughs> you know. So I think as as I said before, I look for somebody that I really, really want to work with. Um, I think of that, I think of getting up in the morning in that accommodation in Edinburgh and having breakfast with this actor and meeting him maybe at London and seeing him again in the evening and being in constant co companionship. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go to take up to Edinburgh some, some arrogant person who's going to annoy me. You know, as I said, I've made one or two yeah, mistakes yeah. like that. But I do look, I do look for the person, not necessarily who fits the role. I look, for, I look for the person I can live with. And in Edinburgh, that is the most. That's really the most important thing you can do. I, I, I loved it. Um, the way you send out your full scripts for actors um, auditioning for your, for your plays to to pick a piece from. I think that can. It's so useful as an actor to have access to more than just the one page that you would typically oh. be auditioning, and I think that's so difficult sometimes for us to make decisions based on, yeah. uh, based on you know anything really. Is that something you've I always done? Do I do that? Well, I wasn't aware I did that. <laughs> I, I I do get the odd. I, I, I remember I, I got the, I think I got the full. Did you? Oh, you must have a very good agent. No. Sometimes I get. No, I think I, I, you... Oh no, no. I I think I actually I think I read the book that your wow. play was based on. So right. maybe I'm, I'm making that up. But the idea that you get to choose the pieces to um, yeah. to audition for, you mentioned that in an answer to a, a previous question. Yeah. I send out usually half a dozen half a dozen pieces uh, and then maybe audition three of them. Mm. So I say, look, have a look at them. I won't, I won't, you know, I won't ask you to read every single one, but here's half a dozen. One's maybe a very dramatic one. One's maybe a comedy one. One's maybe a very, very different. Um, very occasionally, I get an agent who will say, my client wishes to read the entire script. And I'm thinking, all right, okay, then go on then. So that, I'll do that. It doesn't happen very often. Maybe that was mine. We'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> so swiftly <laughs> move on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I shot myself in the foot there. Oh, dear. I never refuse, honestly. I never refuse. Good, good. Um, I'd like to talk about your the, the characters that you write. A lot of your plays do have um, homosexual characters in them. And it's been a big topic in, in the news, definitely in um, the recent weeks as to when we've been recording this podcast about... Um, heterosexual actors playing homosexual parts what are your views on that my my views are i mean an actor is is acting i i really <clears throat> you know i really don't go along with this idea that um you know in order to be to play a, a homosexual part well you you've, you've got to be gay yourself uh i had two i had uh three actors playing uh playing gay in the last one and uh, one of them was playing a Hitler gay. They were, well, they were playing two gay Hitler youth, for goodness sake. And one of them was gay, mm. and the other one wasn't. Um, and of the other two actors, uh, one was gay, and one was wasn't. And the the ones who weren't gay played gay characters absolutely, absolutely marvelously. It's I, I don't know. I mean, a, a straight actor might tell you that he 
some straight actors might tell you they find it very difficult to play gay parts. But, you know, it doesn't doesn't have to be a camp, uh, an outrageously camp part where you where you really have to, um, you know, think of how you're portraying it without without making it look, um, uh, without making it look insulting, you know. Um, but the, the, the gay actors, the, the, yeah. gay, the, the straight actors who played the, the Hitler youth and the one is the Boy Scouts and the Good Scout, were, they didn't play it as though they were gay at all. Uh, and, and of course, if you were a Hitler youth, um, I don't think you could get away with being camp, you know. <laughs> There must have been some of them. Mm. Yeah. Get caught out. Yeah. <laughs> how how can heterosexual actors be better allies to the LGBTQ community? How can heterosexual actors be better allies? Better allies. Yeah. In because it's obviously it's all over the news and yeah. everybody wants equality, but is there things that heterosexual actors could do to be better allies? I don't think there's any. I, I, do you know? I've, I've, I've never, I've never encountered any homophobia on the fringe at all. I've found that they've got on. You know, all the heterosexual actors I've worked with have got on so incredibly well with the with the gay actors. And I, if you were to ask me to think of one, one time in the last twelve years when I've noticed any any resistance for them to get to know each other or help each other out. I haven't. That's that's one of the things I love about theatre. And in fact, going back to my television days, I don't think I ever encountered any um any homophobia then. Um I think that's the great thing the most fabulous thing about our industry. Yes. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um I'd love to sort of conclude by looking forward to the future. And as you said, you know, um, outside world allowing if the, if the fringe is going to go on this year, which we, which we hope it does. Um, are we going to see boys, the empire productions at the fringe this year, if it goes ahead? And if so, can you tell us anything about that project? Because I know you're cooking something up right now. Well, yes. Um, hopefully, hopefully it will go ahead and I'm touching, touching the, the wood of my desk as I speak. Um, I don't want to say too much about it because I'm I'm keeping it under wraps mm. uh, until until we know definitely what's going ahead. But uh, let me just say that it is it is something very different. It's set in the it's set in the 1930s. I love I love history. I love um I love historical periods, and I love um, finding a gay an LGBT storyline that's not that's not set in the present day. And uh, the 1930s, as we know, was was the Jazz Age. And it's a story of uh, of a young man who was um, sentenced to hang for the murder of his mother, and it's a true story. And uh, it's it's got three characters, and plus uh, I want to have a live saxophonist on stage because I want all the mood, the mood of that sort of smoky jazz clubs, soft midnight jazz, and it's it's um it's a very dramatic mm. story, story, but a lot of comedy in it as well. Um, which is, uh, you know, something that's always very important to me. You've got to have make people laugh at times. They can't just be, must be given a very, um, you know, you, 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 you can't just give them a grim storyline with somebody going to the gallows uh, and not make something funny out of it, um, not get some black humour out of it. But it's um, it's it's along these lines. But I won't say any more about it um, because, as I said, I don't want to to um, sort of put a curse on it at the moment. But it should be something exciting and something. Yeah, well, we we really hope it. Absolutely, we we really hope it it goes ahead. And uh, like the the key words to point out there, the sort of um, you know a true story, something you haven't seen before. There's murder, there's gallows, but there's humour. It's it the yeah. jazz music is exactly as you were talking about how to pitch your shows, isn't it? To to yeah. get something to to stand out, and I think you've proven that publicity right there. Yes, and shall I say also that the main character is a gay gigolo. Who was sleeping with um, some of the highest in the land? <laughs> so there we are. That's a that's that's a hoop yeah, to be going the, on. With. <laughs> that's the pitch. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Glenn, for coming to talk to us today about about the fringe and about about your own experiences. I hope that everything goes ahead this year, so we can come up and and support your show ourselves. I know I'd love to. So it's um it's really grateful, and thank you for coming on and giving us your time and knowledge today. I'm very happy, and when when I. When you come up, I'll buy you a burger and uh, a drink and um, show you how to avoid being drowned. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> That's, I think it's a fantastic lesson to end on. 
Okay. Brilliant. Thanks, Glenn. Okay, take care. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our podcast. We hope you enjoyed it and learned something. We look forward to having you back in the room very, very soon.